I was uh, corresponding here uh, long ago, um, 20 years ago, when, uh, as you recall, Japan was about to take over the world. And uh, most of the stories I wrote then were wrong, so uh, I don't think there's any reason for you to believe what I say tonight. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I do think that just as uh, many of our stories then were exaggerated, uh, and many of the fears of Japan taking over the world were exaggerated, uh, so uh, the stories of Japanese decline also, I think, sometimes are, uh, and the perceptions of decline are exaggerated in the West, um, particularly given the outside attention paid to China's rise. Um, I have to say that any foreigner who comes to Tokyo on an irregular basis, as I do, uh, and uh, looks, arrives in the city and sees the prosperity of it and what an amazingly well-functioning city it remains uh, on so many levels, has to think, well, I would take a lost decade like that if, uh, if this was the result. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, the parallels between uh, what's happening politically in this country and what's happening in our country. Um, because um, several uh, of the Japanese politicians we've interviewed or met with uh, this week uh, have themselves made the analogy to Obama's uh, arrival on the scene. And in fact, when I interviewed Prime Minister Hatoyama in New York in September, he also drew a direct connection uh, uh, between the DPJ's coming and Obama's uh, coming in. Certainly, I think there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, similarities. Um, both uh, leaders swept in with a, a real sense of uh, a fresh wind and uh, kind of sweeping clean um, that energized a lot of voters in ways that neither country has seen in a long time. <clears throat> At the same time, I think in both cases, there's questions about uh, what kind of mandate uh, did they arrive with? Is there, uh, is there agreement among the people who voted for these parties of what kind of change they're seeking? And uh, were Obama or Hatoyama and his team clear about what kind of change they would deliver. Um, both of them have a huge amount on their plate, obviously, uh, partly uh, because circumstances have forced that on both of them, uh, especially given the economic situation, and partly because they've both uh, taken on um, very ambitious agendas. Uh, and in both cases, for different reasons, uh, I think it's unclear how much of this agenda they'll be able to uh, realize. But in both cases, they have the oppositions totally reeling. Um, the Republican Party may not be quite as uh, set back as the LDP, because after all, they have, been, they have had experience with defeat in the past, unlike the LDP. But they're, Popularity rating is not much higher than the LDPs, and uh, the sense within the Republicans that they need to completely uh, rethink and reinvent uh, what they stand for is also quite strong. Um, both of them uh, face very strong fiscal limitations on, on their agenda. Um, uh, there's a lot that Obama wants to do, just as uh, there's a lot that uh, the DPJ wants to do, and it's not clear whether the budget situations in either country will allow them to do it. Um, both of them, uh, as, as Roger said, uh, have faced accusations of dithering and unnecessary delay uh, and uh, defense from their supporters that uh, what looks like dithering to critics is, in fact, the kind of deliberation that we would want our politicians to engage in. And finally, I, I think um, a kind of odd similarity uh, is uh, a, a sense of declinism that one finds uh, in both countries um, in slightly different ways. Um, 
uh, Roger talked about uh, the, the theme that we've been hearing here uh, from many Japanese of, of having to accommodate to a world where Japan is no longer uh, as influential as it was, and has relatively lost influence compared to China and perhaps India. And in the Obama administration, there is, not universally, but I think among um, many of his team, also a sense that uh, after 20 decades of a kind of um, misguided uh, unilateralism and unipolarism, uh, it's time for the United States to adjust to a multipolar reality uh, and to adjust to a world where uh, the U.S. is limited in what it can accomplish um, and really needs to work with allies instead of just talking about working with allies. On the other hand, I think there's also a big difference in that regard, uh, which explains why we, helps explain why we may be coming to a moment of tension now. Uh, even though that sense of, of uh, uh, modesty or defeatism, depending on how you look at it, does exist within the Democratic Party, when somebody becomes president, there's a kind of uh, inevitability uh, still, I think, of U.S. power that forces uh, the leader to take certain positions and to um, converge uh, with the positions of the previous presidents. And so you see, for example, um, a strong continuity between Bush and Obama on many foreign policy issues, including most recently Afghanistan, much to the dismay of many of the people in his own party. Um, I think you see that same sense of continuity on, on the part of the U.S. administration when it comes to the U.S.-Japan relationship. And so uh, we see the Obama administration insisting just as forcefully, and maybe more forcefully, than the Bush administration would have, that the Okinawa Agreement be uh, implemented. Um, and I think that may have come as a little bit of a surprise, from what I can gather, to Prime Minister Hatoyama and some of his team, who may have expected that because of the similarities uh, b between them, there might be more sympathy and more patience accorded for uh, the DPJ's desire to step back and review this agreement. Um, and uh, the fact that they're on different wavelengths uh, on that issue, that you have a lot of continuity on the US side and still an unclear amount of continuity on the Japanese side, I think is likely to um, produce continuing tension in the coming months. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.